not nice of her. She knows I, I get emotional. <clears throat> Uh, thank you all for being here. So, uh, uh, you know, part of the reason I think I'm definitely been asked to speak also is the idea gives encouragement to almost anybody that you can be successful in the investment business, provided that you would consider me successful. That may or may not be the case. <clears throat> uh, so, I do not have CFA. I took one finance cl uh, course in, in college. I got a C. Uh, therefore, I was not uh, an educated that the, uh, the market is efficient. I had no idea that it was an efficient market, and I haven't seen that in my experience. Uh, I have the good fortune of uh, my degrees are in accounting. I worked in public accounting, and that accounting firm audited a number of investment advisors, one of which was Tweedy Brown. <clears throat> and so I walked in and started that in 1975, and so it was the perfect time, right? Because that's, that's what it was. Tweedy was, like McDonald's, an overnight success starting in 1975, because you had 73, 74 correction, and Tweedy had a process that really worked, the market rotated, they did phenomenally well, and so that's the entry point that I had to how investing was and what it was. So that was my <clears throat> fundamental course in how to invest and what to invest. It was not taught in school, but it was taught through Tweedy Brown. Uh, then I had the good fortune to work for Mario Gabelli, another client of the firm, for three years as a CFO. Uh, and then at 29 years old, so uh, July this year, it'll be 40 years ago, I started the firm with no money, no experience as an investor, uh, and thought this is something I could do. Today, I think we're reasonably successful. We manage probably $750 million. Uh, the last number of years have been kind to us, and there's been a rotation that I'll talk a lot about today. And so our performance over 40 years is we beat the market, including that's the S&P, and every one of those, other than the 10, 10 years, um, eight percentage points below the S&P. <clears throat> and what we did is we bought cheap stocks, and that was the education that I got from Tweedy. In buying cheap stocks, there's a number of things that happen. And one of those things is there are companies that are run by really smart people, and therefore that was really educational and informative in what they did in capital allocation. The other one was you bought cyclical businesses that were beaten up and out of favor. You could buy a business for a fraction of what those assets were worth, predicated on the fact that that business really had viability and wasn't a buggy whip. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is I believe it's great for all of you if you want to be or are in the investment business because stock picking is where it's going to be the next decade. There's just no doubt about it in my mind. And what I also think has happened is, again, based on macro things, it's the revenge of the old economy. The companies that are going to be successful in the next 10 years are radically different. Right? We've taken a 90-degree turn in where the economic landscape is today and who the winners are and who the losers are going to be. <clears throat> so there's two quotes I want to give you. One's Bernard Baruch, and that is, information cannot serve as an effective substitute for thinking. There's so many examples of this today that people say things. <clears throat> One of the great examples I love about the inefficiency of the market, anybody thinks the market's efficient, I don't know what the hell they're looking at for the last 25 years. What's happened <clears throat> is, is three years ago, when interest rates started to tick negative here, the concept was, well, maybe it makes sense. After all, in Europe, there's 14 trillion, 17 trillion of negative interest rates. It must make sense. It exists. No, it was irrational. It made no sense. But nobody has the conviction to have the time frame to say, that makes no sense. And there's so many examples today of things that you can look at past historical patterns and say, this should work because the last three times, this is what's happened. Do not fall to that trap. Think about it. Think about if we're in a different world today, the outcomes are going to be very different than past experience. And so that's a critical thing. <clears throat> Recently, not so long ago, when Howard Marks wrote his little letter in 21 when he was sequestered with his son, in which he, he hinted at things like, it almost doesn't matter the price you pay for things. So Howard Marks was saying that, right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> he also said, you know, the, the, it, since quantitative information today is so readily available, success to a high degree will really be predicated on superior judgment. And so that's what we believe. You have to think and you have to make judgments, and those judgments are all based on bottom-up stock picking. And that's what we've done, right? So the firm today has 15 people who do research whose passion is to find a stock that's mispriced. That's what it is. It's the passion to find mispriced stocks, and, and that is an invaluable asset to have people like that. And those, most of those people have been with me for a long time. So they have decades of experience in looking for companies and looking for things and changes in those businesses that the valuation of the public market is radically different. So we're actually not looking to buy a cigar buy. We're not looking to buy a dollar for 50 cents. We're looking to buy a dollar for 30 cents, 20 cents. But more importantly, we're also looking for a dollar that can grow to two, three, four. So the fact of the matter is I've realized at this point in my life, here I am, a bottom-up stock picker who doesn't know anything about the macroeconomic buy, doesn't make investments based on that, <clears throat> and as a value investor, I realize I am really a growth investor, because that's what I'm looking for, companies that have significant growth ahead of them, 
And that's probably a recovery of that business. And I also realized that the macroeconomics is really critical. Right? Why value has underperformed for the last 12 years is the abnormal situation and the distortions that that's created. And how do you win if you own, the wrong, if you own a bank? How do you make money the last 10 years? Because there was, no, there was no interest rate. You couldn't make money. And so now those banks are starting to make money. If they can only make enough money to get out of the fact that they did really foolish things, that'll be interesting. Um, Oh, in addition to that, I also want to point out that <clears throat> 15 people doing research then feeds us information, and that's what we're doing. The macroeconomics is this grassroots macroeconomics, and Theo Vandermeer seven years ago came up with that concept. By looking at companies, you look at that business, you look at an industry, you get a picture into a portion of the world's economy, and you understand that. And therefore, Isaac Schwartz, who fortunately, when he was 24, moved to Asia, lived there for six years, had me come to Asia and visit hundreds of companies in Asia, gave me a world perspective, because that's what it is. The world is flat even if things are changing. So th those are, and so now I realize I am a macro uh, top-down investor who is a growth investor. So in investing in those businesses that I told you, cycles, cycles really happen. And they're really hard to recognize today because of, you know, here are these things. So, whoops, I didn't go to, uh, here we go. So the new norm, right, a year or two or three ago, inflation's dead, never going to happen again, the new norm, and you see what happens to interest rates over 40 years. It went one way for 40 years. Not for five years, not for 10 years, not for 15 years. People forgot there are cycles. There are cycles. And what drives that is a number of things. And so, therefore, that's what you have today. And, and of course, when it gets down to that interest rate <clears throat> you, and the discount you put on things, where's the margin of safety? Right? A principle, a key principle of, of Graham is a margin of safety. There's no, there's no margin of safety. We are assuming 1% is the right inflation and 2% is the right interest rate. No margin of safety. You're going to get crushed. You're going to do things. Okay, so in the fixed income market, of course, is a m much larger than the equity market. The fixed income market is totally mispriced. It's totally mispriced. The largest market in the world, is valuations are wrong. <clears throat> and valuations matter, and that's a critical thing. Thinking, thinking about businesses, thinking about what's going to happen, thinking about things. So uh, myopia of linear thinking, you've had this period of time for so long. People thought, oh, this is really it. Inflation really is dead. And, and you know, I love the Mark Twain quote here. It ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And there are so many examples of that today. And you see that, Silicon Valley Bank. What the hell was that? How did they do that? To totally self-inflicted. <clears throat> so, uh, and, and of course, you know, we talk about seven years of lean, seven years of all that kind of stuff. It's 14 years, 14 years this extended period of time has. Fed policy, government policy was totally misdirected. It was intended to ha encourage economic activity. It didn't happen. Economic activity didn't happen. Instead, inflation went away, interest rates went away, people allocated capital based on that. And so, you know, one of the uh, great phrases we love is Templeton, one of his is, uh, if you want to do better than the market, you have to do something different than the market. I would submit to you, if you're a value investor for a decade, if you did something different than the market, you got crushed. There was only one way to outperform. You doubled down. You bought the QQQs because they outperformed the S&P. Nothing else around the world outperformed the S&P. So therefore, there's this distortion that's happened. Uh, <clears throat> the other one, and, and valuation really does matter. That's a critical element. Here, this just goes through. And of course, when you think about it, over decades, which of the stocks and in the, the industries that do well, it, it, it changes. There are cycles that happen. People forgot that. <clears throat> and, and then, of course, it's really great because, right, passive management continues to draw in capital from active management. And so, therefore, for the first time ever, first time ever in your lifetime, right, there's more capital managed passively. And even the active part is probably an algorithm that's based on some computer program that looks at historical patterns over an odd, anomalistic period of time, the last 20, 30 years, when interest rates only went one way. So that, you know, and all of that means there's been a massive and continual misallocation of capital. And I have a little slide there with a normal investing cycle, and that's what you've had, continual up, up, up pieces on certain classes and certain, uh, you know, securities. And then, of course, one of the huge beneficiaries and things that draw capital in have been private equity. And, of course, who would have thought that if you buy businesses and lever them, <clears throat> and interest rates go down and down and down, and multiples go up, <clears throat> and, and you had a leveraged return, you're going to make, like, a good return. And then, of course, you're going to mark to, mark to a model. You're not going to mark to market. So that's a wonderful thing, too. And that's the real risk that clearly exists in that business today, that you see it, right? Interest rates are changing. Cap rates are changing. Valuations are changing. And that process is very slow to work its way through to private equity. And there's a hesitancy because there's a belief. 
that we're going to go back to low interest rates again, or inflation's going to subside, and therefore it'll be okay. And so therefore that's a real risk that that industry is growing and could end up really biting it. Okay. So that's what, uh, so what I think is the world, as I said, a number of, a year, year and a half, two years ago, made a, a 90 degree turn that an economic environment going forward is very different. Right, so the first thing I want to talk about is globalization 2.0. Everybody talks about deglobalizing, reshoring, all those things. It's actually globalization 2.0, not just China. So therefore, for a long time, China has been s such a huge economic impact. But that's changing because China's changed. The other one is climate change and uh, the world's muted response to that. And again, since 1976, I've been an investor in fossil fuels. And so I think we have, again, all of our opinions are based on this bottom-up, grassroots, macroeconomics, looking at businesses, looking at industries, and seeing what's happening. And I think we have a really good understanding of the fossil fuel business, and the, in, in particular, and then the energy business broadly. So, whoops, I can't press the button. So the first thing I say, that's what it is. It's uh, globalization 2.0 is not just China, right? So of course China then, China now, 40 years ago, China was a very different place, right? <clears throat> and China's not the same at all today. And that's what it really is. It's the maturation of the Chinese economy, and therefore the changed elements of what goes on there. And you see it in so many data and statistics points. Right, and that's what the other thing we would also contend is, we actually contend, this is going to be really heresy here, that the Fed <clears throat> has very little impact in reality, other than when they've fooled the market into believing they do, and therefore the market believes the Fed can does it, and therefore believes that. And you had that two, three years ago. A lot of capital was allocated because, yeah, I know interest rates should be higher, but the Fed will keep it down. No, the Fed is not, cannot overrule the market. And the market is what, and what sucked inflation out of the world was not Volcker, it was China that sucked inflation out of the world. China sucked jobs, industries, and inflation out of the world, right? So Ross Perot had it wrong. That great sucking sound was not Mexico. It's been China for a long time. That's why you haven't had, or inflation has been really moderated in many different ways. And so, and we think that's clearly changing for a multitude of reasons. Right, China's a net importer today. Many things they probably were self-sufficient in the past. You know, steel, they have to import all the critical uh, variable costs. Iron ore, met coal, energy. They're not, and, and they do that in a blast furnace, so therefore they create a huge amount of pollution. So China's very different. The population's rolled over. The wage rates are much higher in China today. So all the elements that made them so cost-effective aren't the same today. Now, I'm not saying China's going to go away anytime fast. It's a huge economy. It'll be successful. But its role in the world's economy, which clearly is the most important thing in the last 30, 40 years, the role of China in the world. And so it's changed. It's got a different role today. And it's not going to suck inflation out. If anything, it's going to feed inflation into the world for a multitude of reasons. So you've got this maturation in China. There's the, the population skewing. The other thing I always, when Isaac took me, when we first went 12, 13, 14 years ago, I, I thought about it. I said, gee, isn't this a really odd country? Just think about it. Everybody under the age of 30 is an only child. Now, I'm going to offend people in the audience if they're only children. I think they tend to be really spoiled or can be really spoiled. And therefore, you have an entire population of only children that have four grandparents doting on them, parents doting on them. And so it's a odd, really odd place. There's a whole bunch of demographic issues that that kind of just kind of changes. So China is a different place than it's ever been. Uh, and then, of course, you know, this shows, shows the population distribution. So, so the idea that things are going to move away, they're clearly going to move to other places. And you've already seen that. You've seen a, a massive movement of a lot of industries that have gone to other places in Southeast Asia, to India, because they have a competitive role to play. Now, they are not going to replace China. They don't have the efficiency and the scale of China. And so, therefore, that means higher costs, because you're going to have multiple sources. The sources aren't going to be as efficient. It's going to have, you're going to have to relocate. So there's a huge impact in terms of inflation and inflationary pressures. <clears throat> so that's why I also say it's the revenge of the old economy. <clears throat> and, and, and that really is industries around the world, but definitely in America, who have been competitively disadvantaged for 40 years. The ones that are still around are hugely competitive today. They are tough mutter survivors. Those are real opportunities. Those businesses have also been transformed because there's a number of things that now have barriers to entry. Therefore, they're going to have high returns on capital. They have uh, a tremendous amount of free cash flow. 
And yet the valuations on a lot of those companies today are extremely modest because no one believes it. Because everybody thinks cyclical business is not trading at five times earnings, it's trading at 20 times earnings because the earnings are going to go down to a, 20, uh, a quarter of where they are. And so that's what it is. Look at those businesses. They have structurally been changed over 40 years of undercapital investment and consolidation. And that's where the opportunity is. And the valuation matters. And you see it. It's clear and distinct. Another element I talk about is energy and climate change. And I say that's a We've been investing in the energy business for 50 years. And so what's happened, of course, is the response of all of the world in concern about carbon means we've underinvested in energy. And we're investing only in one portion of energy, right? And, and that started at 5 and 8%, and maybe it's now 10%. And you can't invest fast enough. And you have to invest probably twice as much money as what's being invested today in renewables. You have to do that. And <clears throat> at the same time, we've shut down and winnowed down and not invested in the 80 to 90 percent of energy generation or energy sources we have. And so therefore you've got massive underinvestment on both sides. Renewables, which are clearly part of the equation and you're going to have to ramp up, and, and at the same time you're going to do it on conventional energy too. And, and when you ramp up energy, renewables, there's a change dynamic. For 20 years the cost of renewables have gone down, 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 down. Well that's not the case today and it's not the case for the next number of years for sure. Offshore wind, which we know directly from a number of our investments, is dramatically increasing the cost. You see that. All the, all the firms that are developers off of Massachusetts are all suddenly saying, I, I can't do the project anymore. I, the costs have gone up too much. It's not what I anticipated. And because the idea, one of the things about renewables is it, the demands it makes on the infrastructure are huge. And the infrastructure and resources today pretty much operate at full capacity. You need more of all of those resources. So that's why a revenge of the old economy. It is physical, tangible things that are in high demand. Bringing on new supplies, which you need to do, takes long time, lots of capital, and costs more money than the ones that you're operating out of today. If that's not inflationary, I don't know what you're thinking about. So the world in which I see it, there are so many indicators of inflation is absolutely part of the equation for the next 10 years. And so you, know, you see that in energy. And, and, and China's the only one with an educated, uh, thoughtful process. And what is China doing? They are growing renewables faster than anybody. So you have to do that. At the same time, of course, they're burning more coal. They're ramping up the coal production, right? 55% uh, of the coal burnt in the world is burnt in China. And so therefore, and what they did was when they, last year, when they ramped that up, that meant they could sell natural gas to Europe and, and collect huge amounts of money for that process. But the Chinese economy is not in a permanent state of lower activity with the construction problems that have happened there, COVID responses, yet everybody, you say, oh, oh, but China's not recovering that quickly. You guys, everybody wants everything to be done immediately. Like delays of gratification. What's going to happen in two to three years? You don't think the Chinese economy is going to recover? And, and people will talk about, oh, you don't want to invest because we're going to have a recession. I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? The economy that matters in the world is China. China's been in a recession for two years. So it, we already are in recession. If we go into, yeah, there's a little bit of a, you know, negative impact, but that doesn't last long. If you've got a three to five year time horizon, what that means is there'll be further underinvestment in these things that are critical, that are in short supply and high demand, and therefore opportunities and assets are substantially mispriced. The market is particularly bad at valuing any asset that his cash flow is not so good today because it only can evaluate cash flows. It doesn't understand asset value. It doesn't believe I can buy this asset for a tenth of what it would cost to replace. That's not a great investment. That, that myopia is just like, you know, it's all over the place. It's all, all these opportunities. So as, uh, as I say, the underinvestment in energy is massive. It's all over the place. I better talk quicker because, <clears throat> so the build out of renewables, you have to do that because these are all kinds of you know, things I've already said. Oh, and then here's an, in, this is a, a, a great chart. I think the one on the right-hand side, right? It shows, you know, oils, percentage of energy generation over the world over the last number of decades has gone down, 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 right? And then it shows the green line behind it, if you can see it, is the amount of barrels consumed, right? So the amount of barrels consumed has gone from 30 million barrels a day to 100 million barrels a day. So the fact of the matter is, on a gross basis, and whenever you see those statistics, they talk about, oh, China's doing something about, like, the environment. Oh, they look at the, they're building out all the renewables. And then you look at the number that said, yeah, but the growth in demand over the next number of years won't be met by renewables. They will be supplemented by new, new nukes, new coal plants, new conventional energy sources that the rest of the world's not doing. We're closing nukes. We're shutting coal so therefore, we're, we're further hindering our ability in the next number of years to respond to the world's increasing demand for energy in all forms. 
Not only that, oil is misunderstood by the world, I think. I think there really is today a different place. So, you know, Simmons wrote this book back in 2005, said Twilight in the Desert, said that the Saudis are at some point where there's maturation in their production, and it's not going to be able to grow. And, of course, it was, you know, he, was, he said that. People said, listen, and, of course, he's wrong, and, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, he was, he's like many value investors. He was a little early, but he, there's a lot of credibility to what he says. And so, and you have that now today. You have the Saudis saying, I cannot increase production. And yet, you have a deaf ear on the part of people to be like, oh, no, 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 I'm sure you can, I'm sure you can. You can't. They're telling you that. More importantly, they're showing you that, right? Last year, the spending by the Saudis was up 60%. What they say is, for the next five years, we will keep spending at that level. What we hope at the end of that five years is we'll take production from 12 million barrels a day to 13 million barrels a day. A de minimis increase from the guy that we all think has more oil and you know, it's plentiful and whenever he wants it, he can bring it on, is demonstrating he doesn't have the capability. Oil, the ability, so therefore you need to build up renewables because the, the ability to increase oil production based on an 80 to $100 price it's kind of, it's not that good. There's a huge headwind just because, and that's what's true, we think, of all of our investors. When I was in Canada and visited the lumber company, when I was in Canada and visited with the copper company, when I was, uh, you know, so all of these businesses I look at, and they all say, there's a shortage of fiber. I can't make more, more timber. There's a shortage of copper, but I'm not going to spend money on a new copper mine. And you see copper today, right, the last, you know, uh, this year already, there's like two or three deals. And that's what the copper guy told me. It was, well, in the next two years, there's going to be all these transactions because the big guys can't possibly bring on new production. So the only thing they're going to do is they're going to buy existing production to supplement what they're otherwise doing. So you've got uh, uh, Rio Tinto took the rest of to own Toyo Private. Uh, you've you got uh, Glencore is looking to buy tech. You, you know, so all these deals are looking to happen. And so there's a shortage of re this. There's not a shortage. There's always availability for new resource. The economic resource is in full demand today, and you can see the future. And if you can't see the demand for all of those things going up, including you know, reshoring and, and moving to new places, means you've got to build out infrastructure in all these other countries. What happens when Southeast Asia and India have economic development? So when economic development happens, that means energy consumption increases. So you actually get yourself in a little bit stuck in a, in a bind, and so, uh, you know, those are critical factors. <clears throat> How does this all come back? So North America, we think, also, of course, is a great place to invest in the next decade, right? Because, you know, I'm talking about energy and the critical role that energy plays. North America is different than the rest of the world, or the rest of the developed world, right? Middle East has plenty of this stuff, too. The fact of the matter is, we're in the middle of the largest economy in the world. And so, therefore, we have an, a huge advantage because you can't move natural gas. We are long natural gas for the next decade. Therefore, energy prices in North America are competitively advantaged against the world. Did you hear me say that? If you're an industrial business, you want to be in North America because you're competitively advantaged against the rest of the world. You see that what's going on in a number of industries today. So that's a huge thing that we think that gives huge opportunities for these American companies that have winnowed down, consolidated, and now have control of their markets because of a limited number of people. They have barriers to entry. You can't go in and open a chloralkaloid plant. You can't go in and do these things. There's huge barriers to entry. These businesses are going to make significant money, and the sustainability of that profit will change them from cyclical businesses to have an extended period of time of high profits. The Inflation Reduction Act is the joke of, well, no, it's important and it's critical, but you know, the Europeans complain that we have it and they don't have it. It's the icing on the cake. It's the fact that energy is cheaper here. That's why they're building the fertilizer. That's why Yara is building the fertilizer plant. That's why OCA is building a fertilizer plant. They're building it here because there's low cost energy, and then you get inflation reduction out on top of it. Well, that's great, but there's no way that's going to reduce inflation. That's going to increase inflation. And so here's a couple of, I don't have any stocks, but the fertilizer industry. Everything that's North American based in the fertilizer business trades at four times earnings, you know, it has no debt anymore, there's huge cash flows. You know, in the next three, four years, they're going to generate their market cap and cash flow, and that's the enterprise value too. So those stocks are all cheap. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, you see Ubin going after OCI. <clears throat> they have some business here, but, you know, it's kind of like, of course it's cheap because the market doesn't have the right value on these things. And don't, you don't have to get an institutional shareholder to say, oh, I will buy it because it's anti-ESG. Companies will buy companies because the economics make sense. So uh, I mentioned chloralkaloid. So that business, Olin, Westlake Chemical, there's three guys in North America, have 90% of the market. We're the low-cost producer of chloralkaloid because we have low-cost energy, because we have low-cost electricity. So they're competitively advantaged against the rest of the world. Canadian energy, the oil and gas companies in Canada have no debt. They all trade at like five, four, three times earnings. They have the ability, if they wanted to, to spend more money. There's a huge amount of resource in Canada. I think Canada, even though the Canadians will tell you otherwise, it's a relatively secure place. 
and therefore, you, so you have energy security, long amount of economics, really cheap economics. So, you know, least mentioned before, Paramount, it, Paramount's one of 50 companies in Canada you could buy. And Boone Pickens said, you know, in 1980, he made his money because you could buy oil cheaper on Wall Street than you can in the marketplace. And so it's the same thing is true today, and that will happen. Transactions will bring out the value here. So I'm going to close with, right, so if we had a 40-year juggernaut in the bond market, that's over. Fixed income is still mispriced. It's based on hope. It's, fixed income is based on the hope that inflation comes down to something like 2.5%. But I just don't see that possibly happening, given all the inflationary pressures, before you talk about the fact that governments have ramped up their balance sheets tremendously, because there's no inflation that's come from that. It's come from energy, it's come from fertilizers, it's come from fundamental uh, products. That's what, free money's gone, and that's why we say Brigadoon. Everybody know Brigadoon? It was a play on Broadway, you know, and that's, and it was, a, they, they stumble on this town in Scotland out of the moors, <clears throat> and it's beautiful, it's idyllic, the guy falls in love, they leave, they come back the next day, and they're told, no, that, con that town only shows up one day a year, every hundred years. Anybody, anybody who thinks the last decade is going to reappear, that's financial brigadoon, because it ain't coming back. That was an anomaly, and that anomaly is gone. And if you're holding on to that, you are in denial, and you're going to lose a whole bunch of money, and a lot of capital has been misallocated based on those assumptions that that was the new norm, it was persistent. Clever people then figure out, oh, I can get really smart. If I lever that, I can get a good return. Those people are going to get crushed, and Silicon Valley Bank is silly. It's an unforced error. Why you would take deposit money that goes tomorrow and buy a 15-year bond, you know, what do you think? Or Schwab. Schwab did, does the same thing. Schwab is a leveraged bond fund. It's levered 10 to 1. It's long bond portfolio versus his equity, and they lost half their equity last year. Have a Charles Schwab. Now, the business for financials are recovering because they make money based on interest rates. So the earnings have doubled in the last two years. So hopefully they can stay in business long enough that the earnings will grow to be able to replace what they've lost in the balance sheet by doing a foolish thing. That's what doing. You know, what grade do you have to be in to not know you don't take money that can go tomorrow and go buy a bond in 15 years at 1.4%? At for what? You know what I mean? Uh, so anyway, I'm done. And now I have no time for questions. So, so look at companies, do stock research. That, that, that is a skill that there's no need to have. It went away on Wall Street. You know, isn't Goldman a third of their employees, guys who run computers? It's all computers. It's all statistical. It's all passive money. It's all of those things. Nobody does bottom-up stock research. The critical nature of that is in the next 10 years, that is a short resource today. And if you have it and you develop that skill, you will be invaluable in the, in the world going forward. Thanks. Yeah, Paul. Political unattractiveness of these in, of these operations. <clears throat> no, I'm not looking for some changed policies and new things. I, I do think that every nobody lives under a rock, right? I'm on the board of a bunch of companies, right? We're investors in companies, and instead, uh, I get on the boards with the intent. I think the stock trades for a fraction of what it's worth, and I want to make sure the the the, the, the opportune guy who doesn't go belong and force something to happen at a 30% premium to where the stock price is, which is a third of what the business is worth or a quarter of what the business is worth. So my intent of being on the board is to be someone in the boardroom who could say no to that transaction. And, and, but, you know, three oil and gas companies on the board, of, like, we're clearly cognizant of that. What do we do? How do we do things? And so on, you know, the, the, one of the boards, that's what we do. How do we put in a new system that tracks the fuel usage? How do we change consumption? How do we do these things? How do we electrify part of the fleet? How do we do things that are responsive? And I think you know, energy companies are clearly, in many cases, the guys who can do something about it because we are the ones who potentially are that are causing it. And we're, not co we're cognizant of the issues, and so therefore we're addressing those issues. So internally, almost every company is thinking about that process and becoming a better citizen or not as bad a citizen, right? Because I'm always cognizant of saying fossil fuels, you can't be a good citizen, you know, but you can be a less bad. And that's what it is. That's the problem with, with energy today and climate today. There's no, like, 
if you only want to be perfect or you only want to be bad, that, that's, that you're going to lose. Because it's mitigation. It's how do you do something in between? Because everybody needs energy. That's a, that's a critical element. You got to have enough of it. And but how do you do that? How do you generate it and consume and create less CO2 in the process? Especially when you're going to build all these renewables that are going to then going to go out and build offshore wind farms with a huge amount of cement at each one of those platforms, a huge amount of steel, a two, $400 million vessel that installs the turbine on top of it. The turbines have gone through the roof because all the elements that you put into the turbine are in high demand and they're in short supply and they're bring on new supplies. It's going to cost more money. So all these things cost more money. And there's a huge imp negative impact on the environment for installing renewables, because that's what you do. You put the stuff in up front. You got to build the wind. You got to build the solar. You got to do all those things. And all of those materials that it takes to do that is part of that. Or you got to build out the electrification system. So there's a, it's a front loaded on resources that are already in high demand from the availability, and therefore you need more availability, and therefore that takes time, capital. And therefore, that's going to be inflationary and will delay the process that you could possibly go what you want to do. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I talk about natural gas. Yep. Yeah, and North America being a pretty good yep. source of natural yep. gas. Yep. Uh, I know uh, Berkshire has been buying Oxy very aggressively. Do you have any views on the, na the key natural gas players in US, uh, which could be interesting? Yeah. <clears throat> so so uh, Buffett buying energy companies in the last year, I think is really interesting. It seems to me, for all the, the value people we hang out with and the Buffett people, no one's saying, where the hell has he invested his money in the last year and a half? It's been in fossil fuels, and it's been in the Japanese companies that are tied into all of those minerals and metals that you need. He is clearly investing on this. Because he sees this issue. And no one points that out. Instead, they'll say, oh, he bought Snowflake. Let's go buy some Snowflake. Let's go buy so value investors over the last 10 years. If they stay in business and still had capital, there was huge migration, and they got smarter. Getting smarter also meant there was style drift. And there was justification for buying businesses that had valuations at a time where, <clears throat> again, Lee pointed it out. He showed the number. Right, The 10-year treasury was like 5 to 6%, both in 99 and in 74, 75, you're starting at an interest rate today of one. So the base level of value, because everything is predicated on inflation and interest rate. What's my multiple? And so that's what it is. The multiples for everything, have. we're starting at a base level here. That's a lot scarier, because people have allocated capital based on something that had no margin of safety, was the lowest point ever. So there's larger risks than there were 73, 74, that there were in 99. So especially the high-priced securities. So my time is up, I think.